السلام عليكم فقدان حاسة الشم والذوق هي من أكثر الأعراض شيوعا بعد الإصابة بفيروس كورونا وهي بتصير عند تقريبا 50% من الحالات طبعا هذا الموضوع يمكن يطول ويقعد فترة أشهر وفي بعض الأوقات يقعد فترة أطول وأنا راجعت آلاف من التعليقات السابقة على الفيديوهات اللي عملناها عن الذوق والشم وكمان عشان نفيدكم اكثر انا عملت مقابلة مع اخصية انف واذن حنجرة وتخصص في الانف عشان نناقش المواضيع الجديدة تقريبا حكينا عن جميع النقاط في العلاج بالانف العلاج الشمي علاج في البيت علاج عن طريق الطبيب اشياء تقدر انت تناقشها مع طبيبك وكمان كي استخدام الستيرود والكورتيزون طبعا المقابلة اجريتها في امريكا فيعني الطبيبة كانت تتكلم باللغة الانجليزية وانا حطيت الترجمة باللغة العربية على الفيديو. خلينا ندخل على المقابلة على طول. One of the things that we've noticed is that about 50 to 70% of patients presenting with COVID generally tend to have some sort of smell dysfunction, whether that means completely losing it or at least partially losing it, um, versus Uh, other viral diseases that have a significantly lower incidence of that. We also know that patients that are showing up with symptoms of smell loss, particularly in the last two years, um, if somebody shows up with smell loss, about 90% of those patients have a COVID infection, whether or not we're actually catching it um, in the acute phase or not. So the Reasons behind smell loss are not 100% clear in post-viral olfactory dysfunction. That's the, the term that we use. There's several thoughts behind it. One is that it is affecting the nerves themselves in terms of how they are functioning. Um, another theory is that it is affecting the Uh, supporting cells that surround the nerves called the sustenticular cells. And then the third is that it's affecting the actual transmission pathway. Um, we don't have a, have a great idea as to which of these um, are the particular method, and it could be a combination of all of these. The other component of this is that there is some level of inflammation that is occurring with um, a viral infection. And so you can get swelling of the tissues inside the nose. Um, most people notice increased drainage when you get a upper respiratory infection or a viral infection. So there is a conductive loss, meaning that the smell molecules aren't getting up to the area where you generally would have a sense of smell to begin with. So there's two components. One is a physical um, barrier that might be affected. And then the other is how is the nerve itself being affected by the virus? So one of the things that we like to see is We want to make sure that something is not happening inside the nose. Um, we generally do a full head and neck exam, make sure that all your nerves are intact. Um, and then we do something called a scope exam, which is taking a camera and looking inside each side of the nasal cavity. And this allows us to see if there's any barriers, if there's a septal deviation, um, which is a, uh, The septal deviation is bone and cartilage in the middle of your nose, and sometimes it can be crooked. That's generally congenital, it can be traumatic, but that can affect how air flows inside the nose and prevent molecules from getting to places where they need to. Generally speaking, those are going to be issues that you've had before you've had the smell loss, um, but it can be worsened when you have swelling or inflammation inside the nose. So most patients are going to have resolution of their symptoms, meaning um, their smell is going to start to come back generally within two to four weeks. Um, that's about the natural time course of getting past the COVID infection. That's when we've been tracking patients in terms of when they're no longer infectious. So there is a, a given amount of time that we generally expect things will get a little bit better. Um, if after about a month or so, your sense of smell is completely gone or it's not starting to slowly improve, I would recommend talking to your primary care or an ear, nose, and throat doctor about potential options that you can do to help improve your recovery timeframe. Absolutely. So all of these things cause inflammation and swelling on the inside of the nose, um, and those can prevent a physical barrier from smell molecules from getting up into the high portions of the nose, which is where we have our olfactory epithelium um, and the nerve that helps us with smell. So anytime those barriers are obstructed, you have mucus, kind of swelling, anything that blocks that area can prevent you from 
um, smelling well, which is why when you get upper respiratory infections or when you have allergies um, or stuffy nose, you tend to lose your sense of smell and taste because those things are all related. So one of the things I think that most patients can do is try and reduce the inflammation that you have inside the nose. If you've got a history of allergies, if you know that there's something that bothers your nose. So avoiding triggers like smoke, um, alcohol, those things can make uh, the, the irritants inside your nose much more likely to cause increased mucus, edema, drainage, and those can make um, your sense of smell recovery a lot slower. Um, if you've got allergies, making sure that you can use a salt water rinse, um, topical nose sprays, things that you can pick up over the counter like a Flonase would be appropriate, um, or an oral antihistamine. One of the other things that we have been recommending that patients can do at home is something called olfactory training. And that is um, very easy to do. It does take a little bit of time and legwork, but involves using essential oils um, to essentially retrain how your nerves work. And if you think about any smell or taste, all of that is a combination of a memory. It's not necessarily just one component. So for example, if lemons taste bad, to try and regain the sense of smell of a lemon, you wanna think about what a lemon looks like, what the visualize a lemon, you know, the memories associated with that. So our sense of smell is very intrinsically tied in with our memories. And so if you can recreate some of those um, memories associated with the smell, it helps with um, realigning some of the, that misalignment that you get with um, parosmia or the foulness that you get with some of these altered senses. So it, this is a, a long-term uh, treatment plan. So generally speaking, we like patients to start on their first set of um, essential oils for about 12 weeks, twice a day. And then after those initial set of essential oils, we recommend switching to another set, doing that for 12 weeks, and then a third set. Um, this is like running a marathon. You're not going to be able to do it in a week. It's going to take some time to be able to rebuild those nerve fibers to align in the proper way and, and get everything to work the way that it used to before. So oral steroids is something that I would be cautious about. Um, oral steroids are, are something that we use very sparingly for patients. Um, they do have significant side effects. Um, especially because they're going into your entire body. Um, they can affect blood sugars. They can affect how your bones function. They can affect a lot of different things, including your sleep cycles and your activity. And so it would not be something that I would lightly recommend. The other component of COVID is that it is a longer inflammatory process and oral steroids work in a more temporary fashion. And so it may not get you the um, outcome that you necessarily want. Topical steroids, which are nasal sprays, are something that are much more um, efficacious. They are, are, have a lower uh, risk profile, meaning the safety of them is significantly higher, especially if you want to use them in a long-term basis. And they work directly where the inflammation is happening. So you're not diluting that medicine in your entire body which tends to be a lot safer for patients, especially if you've got other medical problems going on. So I would absolutely recommend using a topical nasal steroid, but I would be very hesitant about um, an oral steroid unless there's some other underlying reason why your doctor feels that this would be important. Nasal steroids generally tend to work very slowly. The reason being is that the systemic absorption of them is very low. And so when you use them in your nose, it takes several weeks for enough of that medicine to build up in your nasal cavity for it to actually start working. So a lot of patients come in and say, hey, I've use nasal steroids, but it doesn't work well for me. And we have a discussion that you do need to use these for several weeks before you'll start to see a difference. And so I would generally recommend at least a six to eight week trial of nasal steroids before you completely dismiss them as not working. If you have a nasal septal deviation, generally speaking, fixing it or straightening it is not going to fix the smell loss, particularly if you already were smelling before you had surgery, before you had um, COVID, then fixing the septal deviation isn't necessarily likely to reverse that issue. Fixing a septal deviation generally is to prevent um, 
uh, obstruction on one side of the nose from getting worse, and so you want to be able to improve the airflow. If you have some sort of inflammatory disorder, such as nasal polyps or allergic rhinitis or something that causes inflammation inside the nose, those things tend to maybe get a little bit better when you fix the uh, straighten out the septum, but it wouldn't necessarily change how the nerves function or how the smell itself is affected. Oh, mashallah, yeah, it can't be a very good thing. A lot of information is mentioned, and I would like to tell you that it can be a very good thing. It can be a very good thing. It can be a very ويمكن تناقش مع الطبيب المعالج هاي المقابلات وعشان تعرف أكثر عن تغير الرائحة والرواح الكريهة اللي بتصير بعد الإصابة بفيروس الكورونا بتقدر تشوف هذا الفيديو من نفس المقابلة مع الطبيبة وإن شاء الله بنشوفكم في الفيديو الجاي ودمتم سالمين